And if you don't have great leadership who surrounds themselves with wonderful people, you won't get a good anything. You won't get a good organization, a good business, or a good restaurant. If you really believe in what you're doing, if you really believe in it, and you get knocked down, and I've been knocked down, everybody gets knocked down at, at some point in time, you get back up. We're going to do whatever it takes. And that's, that's, that's a lesson right there. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? Well, thanks, everybody, for joining us today. This is uh, the Local Legends podcast, where this is a, a partnership that the Venture Project and the Oshkosh Chamber of Commerce uh, combine and collaborate to find some different local business personalities, leaders, or entrepreneurs that uh, have some Oshkosh roots. And towards the top of our list was, was Mr. Craig Culver himself over here, the founder of the Midwest sensation Culver's. Mr. Uh, Culver, thank you for jumping on the show today. You're welcome. Uh, you know, uh, my family does have roots here. Uh, my mom is from here. Uh, my grandparents had a had a dairy farm in Pickett, Wisconsin. If you all know where Pickett is, I'm yep. sure you do. And they eventually moved in the in the city of Oshkosh. And of course, I went to school here as well. And uh, we have businesses here as well. So. The whole Fox Valley is pretty important to us, and yeah. they treat us well. Yeah. Well, so I know I know Culver started year 1984, but what, what what was your life like before the Culver's world? Hell. <laughs> 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 no, I uh, and you know I've told the story so many times, but uh, I grew up in the restaurant business. Uh, uh, if you've heard my story, uh, you know that. Uh, when I was 11, mom and dad bought a little uh, a and drive-in in Sauk City, Wisconsin. Still home uh, to me yet today. And uh, mm -hmm. and uh, never not been in the restaurant business since uh, since that point, when 1961, I guess it was. But I, I always swore growing up I'd never, never be in the restaurant industry. Because I watched mom and dad. Uh, it's, it's like a farming, uh, like farming. I mean, everybody goes to work, and it's early in the morning to late at night, uh, seven days a week. And I always swore I'd never stay in the restaurant business because I didn't want to be them. But guess what? I did, <laughs> and it's been so. I've been so blessed because of it. Uh, I I like to say, uh, you know, we're in the people business, is what we are. Yes, we serve butter burgers and frozen custard and cheese curds and all that stuff, but we're all. We're all really in the people business, De developing people, uh, mentoring people, uh, growing people. and uh, But uh, I would say every one of us in this room is in the people business as well. Every one of us. Yeah. Well, so I want to touch on that in a little bit. But tell me, where did this idea come from? I know you were a student here at UWO. Um, but when did you kind of get this idea for Culver's? Well, you know, you've got Leon's frozen custard here in town. Everybody knows Leon. Yep, and I knew it too. And uh, whenever I had a chance, when I was a student here, I'd run over there and get a vanilla cone. And this stuff was so good. I mean, so good. And at that time, I never thought about, you know, having a custard stand, really. Uh, but years later, uh, when my family had a little supper club, in Baraboo, Wisconsin, uh, called the Ritz, of all things. And we always attached our last name to it. So in this case, it was Culver's Ritz. But uh, sitting there one day in the afternoon, uh, having a beer with a friend of mine who grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And we were talking about drive-ins, like Leon's and, and uh, Cops and all those wonderful places. Well, he told me he grew up next to this custard stand Anyway, it was a burger stand, and it was called the Milky Way. What a great name for a, you know, a, a, a root beer stand. And he said they served the butter burger. And when he told me that, uh, I connected the dots with frozen custard and butter burgers. And I said, if I ever get the chance, I'm going to do that. And uh, wasn't, uh, it wasn't a year later when uh, the people that we had sold the NW Drive-In to gave us a call and said, we don't want this place anymore. We had sold it on a land contract where we're the banker in the deal. And we ended up getting it back. 
And that was our opportunity with frozen custard and butter burgers. And get rid of the a name, put our name up there. And uh, the first year in business in 84, uh, uh, again, I've told this story so many times, but we just about lost everything. Uh, but somehow or another, we made it through that first year. Uh, I, I like to chide bankers a lot, but we had a banker that believed in us during that first year. We had worked with, with him and his bank prior to that and other businesses. He knew the Culver family. He knew, you know, he knew how hard we worked and stuff, and he stayed with us. And he got us through that first year, and after the first year, we grew the business. And Something that's interesting that's unique, I think, about your story is the, the nature of a family business and how you were able to kind of navigate that. Or just tell me a little bit about um, how you were able to kind of work with each other and what your roles ended up being and, and how other people can do that if they have a, an aspiration to be a family business. In my case, you know, I grew up in it. I, uh, we had the, the little a and We had the farm kitchen resort. Uh, um, we had the, the Ritz uh, Supper Club. Uh, we had a number of businesses. And I always worked with my family, uh, my my mom and dad, and and now my ex-wife Lee, and it just seemed normal to me. It really did. Yet it's different, you know. <laughs> in high school, uh, we were seemed like we were working all the time instead of my buddies were going out and doing this and that, and and families were getting together doing this and that and uh, different holidays and celebrations. Well, guess what we were doing? We, we were in the restaurant. We were taking care of all those people that were celebrating whatever they were celebrating. And it, and it was normal, although there were times when I said, geez, I wish I could be like the, you know, the other kids. But uh, I grew up with loving parents uh, who um, were my business partners, but also great parents. So... Uh, I'm the luckiest, you know, I, I say kid. I'm going to be 72 here <laughs> in a couple months. So, But I still think of myself like that. And uh, I was a, my brother and sister and I, we were pretty lucky people. What do you think was the that kind of differentiator that, that started to set you apart early on uh, when you started to know we got some traction here? Yeah, I also spent a number of years with McDonald's after I graduated from college here. And uh, <laughs> uh, thinking, McDonald's, what am I doing there? But uh, I learned a lot from the McDonald's people. But after uh, four years with them, I started to become my father. Uh, the entrepreneurial spirit started to burn within me. And I wanted my own business. I did. I had no money. And I'll go back to the bankers, again, chiding them. They don't lend money to somebody that has no money. <laughs> and uh, But I would have liked the McDonald's franchise. But that just was not in the cards. That mm -hmm. was not going to happen. Yeah, they're really expensive. You know, Ex and, and very uh, um, very picky about who they yeah, they require they a certain in. amount of liquid net worth. Oh, and yeah. All that. It, it wasn't even yeah. close. And But I thought to myself, all the training I've now got, working for my family all those years, mm -hmm. working for McDonald's for four years, how about if we buy that A&W back in Sauk City, Wisconsin, our hometown? And uh, so I gave my dad a call. He, they were living in Madison, and I said, Dad, help me out here. And, you know, Dad responded immediately, let's do it. You know, he was, I don't know how old he was at that time, near 70, I guess, or something like that. But he was still the entrepreneur. My mother, on the other hand, not a risk taker whatsoever. <laughs> you know, she grew up in a dairy farm right in the area yeah. here. Had the first dollar she probably ever made. And when she, my dad said, let's go buy it, my mom would say, George, you better not. <laughs> she thought she was done with the restaurant uh, business. But uh, I, I like to joke, uh, we voted and she lost two to one. So we got back in the in the business. Do you think that like, that, that like entrepreneurial spirit is just like you're born with it or you find it? Or what do you think? Well, that's yeah. a great question. Uh, um, when you have somebody around you, like my father, that was an entrepreneur, I guess it just kind of... Uh, uh, it just kind of dripped into you. I guess it did. And uh, um, 
but I, I didn't know anything different, really. It just seemed so natural, natural to me. There's something about being, uh, you know, having your own business. Uh, uh, a lot of people think, oh, I can take off here and there. I can do whatever I want. That's not the case. <laughs> not the case if, if you really want to be successful at what you're doing. But it did seem normal to me. And I just kind of drifted into that direction. And um, I like leading people. I like uh, people also... Uh, um, I like that to help them grow, as I was talking about earlier. And it's so cool to see people that you've been around for a while and you've maybe mentored them or something. They got something from you. And to see how they develop over years. We've got so many people at Culver's that have been with us a long time. And to think that you may have had a little bit to do Mm -hmm. with the people that they've become today, not only as business people, but also as just people. You know, you've, you've seen the confidence in them as, again, as business people, but also just wonderful people as well. Tell me a little bit about early on in, in Culver's when the business started to grow and you, you made the decision to start franchising. How did that go about? How did that happen? Well, that was uh, about our third year in business. The first year we lost who knows how much money. Second year we broke even. Third year we started to make money. And uh, and then we had the bright idea, let's see if we can franchise this. <laughs> let's see if we can franchise this thing. And at that time we had three of our own restaurants. So you can call them company restaurants, corporate restaurants, whatever. Uh, but uh, Culver Franchising had not been born yet. But uh, my father and I, uh, we decided let's let's give franchising a try. And I'll never forget, um, um, in that third year, it was a busy Sunday, and this woman comes up to me to, at the counter and says, "Don't ever franchise this thing. You'll ruin it if you do." <laughs> it's just. Dicks in my head I, to yet today that I tell you that. But we gave it a shot anyway. And uh, in 1987, we opened our first franchise restaurant in a town about 45 minutes from uh, Sauk City. And one year after opening that first restaurant, franchise restaurant, uh, we got a letter in the mail from their lawyer saying my client doesn't want to be part of the story anymore. He wants out. And it hurt. I mean, it really hurt. We put so much blood, sweat, and tears into opening that first restaurant. And um, so we hire the lawyer as well. We negotiate out of the deal. And I said after that event, I'll never never franchise again. Obviously, that didn't happen that way. Um, time heals wounds, fortunately. And uh, it was uh, in 1990 when we opened our first successful franchise restaurant. And that was in Baraboo, Wisconsin. And just this last Monday, we opened a, another restaurant in uh, uh, Glendale in Milwaukee area. And that, that's number 861. Oh, my gosh. Wow. Yeah. And, well, the last uh, two years, we've opened over 50. In the year of the COVID, in 2020, we opened 50 restaurants. 2021, we opened 51 restaurants. Now... It's not that important to me how many restaurants we open, but, I mean, things just, they've been, been rolling. And we've got a pipeline with a couple hundred restaurants in it that have to get open at, you know, over the next few years. So, but i got to tell you this. One thing my dad told me many years ago, he said, Culver, it's not important how many restaurants you have. What's important is how many good restaurants mm -hmm. you have. And if you don't have great leadership who surrounds themselves with wonderful people, you won't get a good anything. You won't get a good organization, a good business, or a good restaurant. And Dad uh, drove that into my mind. And I knew we had to we had to have great people in order to make this thing a true success. Well, let's talk about that for a second, because I think one thing that most people notice about the Culver's business is the consistency, restaurant to restaurant. The quality is is unmatched, I think, among most people. Most people would argue in the restaurant business, the franchises seem to be all pretty consistent. What is the 
what 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 was the secret sauce to get that going? How did you how do you keep such good quality throughout? I just all told you, the, the people. I huh? just told you. It, it's you, you've got to uh, surround yourself. The first time we franchised, that one that didn't work, um, I just thought, well, this is easy. You just you know you just find somebody delegate, that's interested yeah. that's interested, and you're assuming they're just like you. Well, that's not the case, you know. If if they don't show up for work, you know the owner doesn't show up. You know what, what kind of message is that sending to all the team members and to the guests as well? So um, I I was so naive when we first franchised a restaurant, that first one, and I've you know learned a lot over the years as we as we got much better at it. And our training program when we started uh, was a couple weeks. Today it's 17 weeks of training before a franchisee ever opens their first restaurant, and that is so crucial. And part of the part of the deal with a lengthy training program is yes, uh, you're going to learn the business, um, but uh, what it also does it grows the relationship between you and the franchisee, and I'll call that culture is what I'll call that. And one of the most important things, no, the most important thing uh, with any business or organization, it's culture. And you can have a good culture or you can have a very negative culture. It's our intent not to just maintain culture but to grow our culture. And you do that with people. You don't do that with a butter burger or frozen custard, any of that. You do it with people. And if, if you're served with a please and a thank you, and a genuine smile that comes from your heart, we call that an experience is what we call that. It makes the butter burger or whatever taste a lot better when it's served by somebody that really cares. And so that's the challenge, you know, we've always had and will continue to have. And, and everybody knows the market we're in right now, the labor shortage, uh, it's difficult. It is difficult. But I see it getting a little better. I do, but uh, the pay grade today, uh, you know, in Madison, we're at 17 and a half an hour. Uh, Sauk City, we're at 15, 16 bucks an hour. Spring Green, little Spring Green, 1,400 people, we're at 15 bucks an hour. I, you know, I, I never dreamt that uh, uh, some time ago, but that's, that's where we've gone. So, actually, I ate at Beaver Dam today, and... Uh, of course, prices have to go up when you're, you know, when you're, and I, I was, geez, does it cost that much at my own restaurant? Yeah, we just bought 50 of them. Yeah, <laughs> I can't imagine what you guys paid. <laughs> it was well over $100, I'm sure. Well, actually, John will catch the bill here. The chamber, so, you know, but, uh, well, well, I think that, you know, that, that brings up an interesting, I think, tactical problem. A lot of other people in the area, restaurants, you know, staffing, right? With the staffing oh. shortages. I mean, how... What what did you what what are you doing or have you done or are you still trying to solve the problem or that's uh, that'll never stop never stop and, and even from many years ago when there wasn't a labor labor shortage you always want the very best people on your team mm -hmm. and and I believe in compensating I do I I, I want the best people and uh, but it's it's more than that again I'll go back to the leader. The leader sets the example for everybody, everybody, the whole team. But the leader also sets an example for all the customers, all the guests coming into the restaurant as well. Don't think when you're the owner that the guests aren't watching you. Now, a story about my mother back when we had the Farm Kitchen Resort, a wonderful resort, a uh, beautiful restaurant, and my mom was always dressed to the nines and... Um, but that didn't stop her from getting down on the floor and picking things up or carrying bus tubs back to the kitchen, so on and so forth. And guests see that. They see the owner doing things that they don't expect the owner to do. I think that's important. I like to share the story about coming to work in the morning, getting out of your car and walking to, to our building, to the restaurant. And there's some garbage on the ground over there and some over here. And are you the person that says, 
well, somebody will get that. Mm -hmm. No, you get that. You pick up that garbage and you throw it away. And that's and not because somebody's watching. You do it because it's the right thing to do. And, um, you know, that was certainly my mom and my dad, too. They set such a great example for us. So when you're looking for these potential owners of a franchise, you're, you're, I imagine you're looking for this type of person, right? That's someone that's going to, as, as our T.J. Rogers podcast, he said, show the flag, right, is le leading the way here. Sure, we're always looking, but we don't go out and try to find them. They find us. They yeah. really do. And if somebody's truly interested, then they, they don't sign a franchise agreement yet, but they go through uh, what we call uh, Discovery Week. It's one of those weeks of that 17 weeks of training. And uh, they go through one week of, of just getting acquainted with one of our restaurants, with trainers, of course. And they are interviewed by a number of our people, our, our executives. And we are looking, at, is this the right match for us? And, of course, they should be looking the same way at us. Is this the right match yeah, for like me? Like any relationship. These things are $3 million to build, you know. When you buy the land, the building, the equipment, uh, we can we can cross the line in three million in a hurry, and so it, it's it's a big deal. It's a real big deal, and uh, so we better make sure we've got the right match, and they better make sure that you know they're they're feeling they're feeling really good about this, and these are the people that we would like to do this with. So you mentioned you know a little earlier that we're all in the, in the people business, yep. right? And that, that it's relevant to all of us. Talk a little bit about that. I mean, how, what are some good lessons that I think young entrepreneurs or other business leaders listening to this need to know now? It's not always about the money. It isn't. Although you've got to make money, you do. And we went through, you know, times when we didn't make money, but if you really believe in what you're doing, if you really believe in it, and you get knocked down, and I've been knocked down. Everybody gets knocked down at, at some point in time. You get back up. You get back up, and if you really believe in what you're doing, if you really have passion for what, you, you know, what your business is or organization is, you don't give up. You just don't give up. And that very first year at Culver's, I was close to that. But I was fortunate to have my family around me. And even though my dad and I, we had plenty of arguments about lots of different things, he was there for me. He was. And my wife was there for me, and my mom was there for me. And they said, Craig, we're going to do whatever it takes. And that's, that's, that's a lesson right there. Are you willing to do whatever it takes? Are you willing to go in very early in the morning, stay throughout the whole day, and go home late at night? And that's not so easy to do. If you've got a young family and stuff, that is not easy. So <laughs> balance of life is, is a difficult thing, especially for a young business person. Um, with young children and such, it's, it's very, very difficult. And that's why, you know, uh, husband and wife, they've got to um, talk a lot. They've got to communicate a lot. And they've got to understand each other and the, and the, the issues that both are going through whether it's at home with the children or at, at, the, at the business. And uh, in order for them to really get through it and be happy doing it, they have to communicate. And uh, communication is a two-way street. You know, listening is a pretty important part of that. Uh, <laughs> I'm not a marriage counselor, by the way, by any means, but uh, uh, communication... can solve a lot of problems, though, I've found. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's hope. Uh, but uh, communication is so key. Yeah. Well, what, so, you know, just listening to you speak, you have a, a lot of drive. You have a lot of intensity. I mean, what are some of the, the personal tactics you've learned to adopt, the kind of lessons of success that you found personally in your kind of routines and rituals? Well, I like to be humble. I, I don't like to, I don't, I don't ever want me or any one of our team members saying something poorly about a competitor. Just don't do that. You may think about it, but don't do it. And so being humble. Uh, um, you know, success uh, can be very fleeting, by the way. You can have it one day, and it, it can go the other way in a hurry 
if you're not if you're not engaged in the business if you're not taking care uh, taking care of business uh, but like I said having the attitude of doing whatever it takes um, and I'll tell you what right now in America I don't know if that attitude is out there so much and honestly for businesses that do have that attitude it's making their business better and they're gonna they're gonna beat some people up because they've got a different attitude than what they are I'm sorry to say this but America's America's soft right now. They are. And don't write that down. <laughs> don't. Don't write that down because I'm not going to get political here. But uh, um, I think we need a different mindset in America than where we are right now. Well, what, I mean, what do you think? Not don't, to, not to no, dig into too much. Don't. <laughs> but, but, uh, <laughs> don't go there. <laughs> but I think, you know, what you're talking about here is I think the kind of some, some classic virtues of, of discipline, consistency, being able to do hard things, right? Absolutely. Uh, you know, no, nothing's free. Nothing is free. You've got to earn it. And uh, uh, that's, that's just my mindset. But I, there's a lot of people that don't have that mindset. Yeah. They think, yeah, things are free. I have a right to that. And so... Yeah, probably know which side of the aisle I'm on. <laughs> well, you, 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 you're, you're very impressive, and you know you're going to this this UWO uh, entrepreneur Shark Tank kind of stuff. Yeah. you know thing that today. Um, when these guys pitch stuff to you, what are things generally that you like to look at as good ideas? You know, if someone approaches you with a an investment or an opportunity. What's something that you just won't touch with a 10-foot pole, and what's something that actually piques your interest usually? Well, I'm gonna rec- I'll recognize whether there's true passion uh, be- behind the people that are pitching tonight. Okay. I've, been, I've been doing this from the get-go with yeah. UW Oshkosh. They have a great entrepreneur club, and other universities have caught on uh, to this, but Oshkosh is you know, one of the early ones and, uh, and uh, one, of the, one of the best, I think. But, you know... I'll recognize if there's passion there, and that's that's key. It, it, are they just pitching something to pitch something, or do they really believe in what they are pitching? And and that's key. And and then they've got to tell a story as well. And that you know that's it's important that they're telling that story and not stumbling over themselves when they when they tell that story. So. You're gonna you're gonna find out how well rehearsed they are as well, or they just trying to get into this tonight and you know just ramble through it. But uh, in the past, uh, uh, especially the last couple of years, they uh, people know what they're talking about, and they generally they are very passionate. But you're looking for new ideas as well. I, you know, one of the things with Culver's is uh, I didn't want to be like. Uh, the per, you know, the company that I had worked for. I wanted to be different than them. I wanted to serve fresh food. I didn't want it sitting there in a bin and taking it. I wanted crinkle cut fries. I wanted to be different <laughs> in that respect. I wanted frozen custard. I'll never forget um, a gentleman that uh, again, I won't mention the, the names, but uh, a gentleman that has a very successful frozen custard business in Milwaukee yet today told me way back when you can never be successful at in a chain business with frozen custard you know when somebody tells you something you can't do but you believe you can you're going to go at it even harder and uh you know I like those little things when somebody tells you yeah you can't do it yes I can (laughs) watch me well, I think uh, there's kind of two points that are interesting there is just this idea of differentiating yourself and yep. kind of the, the strength of the founder, the passion of a founder going into something if they truly believe in it or if they're just trying to make a quick buck. Um, there was a, another venture capitalist type that was in here and said the same thing. He said, well, 80% of what we look at is strength of founder. And I was like, that's really a, an interesting metric. I would have thought you're looking for projections and all this stuff. He said, we look at strength of founder. So to hear you say that is, is another affirming uh well that's a little opinion. scary as well because you know how long is the founder going to hang on um um portillo's uh wonderful company um um uh, well they were sold what two years ago and 
I wondered after that, how are they going to hang in there? Because this guy was, he was the business. I serve on the board of Quick Trip with a K. And uh, <laughs> Don Zietlow, Don is our patriarch. Don is 87 and still the CEO. Uh, but the job of a board is also to path away for succession. And, geez, when Don isn't there any longer, I'm, I'm, but, you know, that's the job of a board, so it, it continues the way it should continue. Uh, I wonder how we're going to do when Don, when Don exits. He's as sharp as a tack yet. And, uh, but, uh, yeah, I think founders are important. I, I, I do. We, I'm not the CEO any longer, but I'm still very involved on a, not in a day-to-day bit business, but lately it seems like I am. So, but I love what I do. I just, you know, I love it. Yeah. Well, like you know, looking out into the future, um, what kind of you know industries, or at least in maybe the restaurant business or other industries you're associated with, trends do you do you start to see that would be good ideas for people that that should that are interested in solving problems out there. Hmm. Well, technology comes to mind, but I am, I am just not, that's not me. Hey, we were talking about NFTs before. Yeah, what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, the world is, is, it's all about technology right now. So, I mean, if you're especially good in that area, um, you know, that's an easy choice for you to go in, but still you got to find a different direction mm-hmm. as well. You uh, you know, one of the brightest people in the world, I think, is uh, uh, Elon Musk. Uh, here's a guy that, oh my gosh, he's brilliant. You know, he's just, and he, he's a guy that, he must lie awake at night dreaming. Uh, <laughs> what a visionary he is. And where he has gone with Tesla and the SpaceX and things like that. And uh, so... The, I don't know. Do you think there's a there's a, there's room for technology improvement in, in restaurants? I mean, you see yes. the, you see the robotics and all these things that <laughs> McDonald's has invested in. And I mean, what yeah, do you, what do you yes think about and that? no. Um, um, I've said this in the past publicly that you know I don't want our people, our guests, ordering through a machine. <laughs> I just don't. I, I'd love the you know, the people-to-people thing, looking at somebody in the eye. But, you know, uh, I don't know where it'll be 20 years from now. I, I don't. And with the labor shortages that uh, uh, everybody's having, uh, you know, they're all looking in, in that direction. When, when we went into COVID, March 12, 2020, um, dining rooms all shut down. We weren't ready. Well, nobody was ready for this, but I mean, tech, tech, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Technology-wise, uh, we were not ready. We did not have online ordering ready. Uh, we did not have any double drive-throughs ready, um, and yet we were busy as can be. We were. I mean, hate to even say it, but we crushed it. We just did, but. Uh, we became the slowest fast food <laughs> restaurant in the world at that time. The lines at drive through were out to the streets and and stuff. But um, it showed us that, and I'll take I'll take the blame for that because uh, I'm not a great technology guy, and uh, I was kind of poo pooing some of that stuff that we had been working on, and. Uh, and then, boy, it came, and we needed it, and found out how wrong I was. So, founders aren't always right by any <laughs> means, not by any means. But I, yeah, technology will come, become bigger and bigger in our industry, as just like any industry. Bitcoin, you know, where is Bitcoin going to fit into our business? It's going to fit in there, so, or something like that is going to fit in. And uh, do we accept that now, or? Do we wait, 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 wait? Uh, I think we right now we got to learn more about it and uh, see if there's a way for uh, that to fit into our business. Yeah. 
One thing, uh, and this is just one of, you know, as a fanboy of Culver's, who, whose idea was this cheese curd burger? I want to shake the hand of that guy <laughs> that came up with... I'll, I'll, give, I'll give Quinn Atkins a credit <laughs> on that one. And it was just a joke. It really was. What uh, a great joke. On April 1st of what? <laughs> April 1st of 2020? Is it? Yeah, I think that was it. Uh, uh, we, we put that out, that uh, a new sandwich at, at Culver's, April Fool's. <laughs> uh, but we got so much uh, interest in that that we, uh, Quinn, he's our he's our chef, and he created that thing. And uh, well, I don't know if any of you got one or not uh, because we were out within hours uh, uh, when that came up. People were lining up at eight o'clock, and we opened at ten or ten thirty. People were lining up at drive-through at eight o'clock to get. One of those silly things. But saying silly, it was actually pretty good. It, it was really delicious, was. yeah. And will it come back? Don't write this down either, okay? Uh, I, I hope it comes I back. Hope so but too. I hope we're a little more prepared for it. It'll come back for one day only, though. <laughs> it's, it's not something that's going to go on the menu. Well, I think there's a lesson in there, too, of like, you know, having, allowing people to be kind of creative oh, with, with what they create, right? Absolutely. Uh, and at Culver's, being, you know, be, with the custard, we can be so creative with uh, yeah, how many the flavors are up to now, oh, or whatever. Who it is. knows? I, you know, <laughs> uh, I don't. I don't even know. But uh, uh, yeah, we can be do so many different things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to give uh, a few moments for folks in the audience that might have some questions here. Reed, you want to grab a mic? We just ask if you do ask Craig a question that you use the microphone so we can get this on the record, um, because we found out that. People in the audience usually have a lot better questions than I do. Or is a mic? It's usually it's right back here. We got anything here? Yeah, Jake. Uh, first of all, Craig, thank you for coming. This, I hope you don't take lightly how inspiring your story is, especially in a room full of entrepreneurs. Um, some of your stories about like almost going out of business and stuff like that. Like my hair's on my arm stood up, and I hope like you know that that's really inspiring for us. So thank you for that. Uh, my question is, you've talked about this idea of balance, not only with like work versus your family life, but like you're not above going and like picking up trash on the ground or working with your frontline people. But clearly you've done a really good job at scaling your business where you're creating 50 restaurants a month. A year. You have, what's that? A year. I, I, that's what I meant, a year. Sorry. Um, yeah. Did you ever struggle kind of with that balance of like working in your business for, versus like the big picture or like... Does that question kind of working make sense? in the business like, versus working on the business? Yeah, on right? the business and like knowing like if you should be like, you know, too involved with the operations or you're getting too into the details of it and like you need to take a step back and lead. Does that make sense? I was I was the worst. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it was Culver's, 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 Culver's. I I have three wonderful daughters, and uh, and you know what? I probably wasn't the best father. I wasn't because you know I. It was Culver's. And when I was at home, you know, what I was thinking about was Culver's. Mm -hmm. And, of course, you know, I'm not the only one. And, you know, when you're at work all the time, you think, well, geez, I really should be home, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it, you just got to get past that. Mm -hmm. you, you have to. And like I was mentioning, especially with a new owner, you know, with a young family and stuff, ooh, it's difficult. Mm -hmm. It really is difficult. But... Um, I heard Indra uh, uh, from PepsiCo. Uh, can't think of her her last name, but uh, she was the CEO of PepsiCo for ten years. And I remember her talking about this, and um, she had a her husband stayed home with their children, um, and Lee pretty much stayed home with our children as well. Yet she worked some too with with us, but. I remember Indra saying, you know what? You just got to get past it. You just got to get past it. Do what you can. And, you know, when you're at home, you try and be the best father or mother that you can be. And when you're at work, you try and be the best manager, CEO, president, whatever you are uh, as well. Uh, you know, balance doesn't end there. I, 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 you need time for yourself as well, you know. And you need time for your spiritual self as well. And it takes, it takes time to get that, some balance there. And 
I, w- I wasn't very good at it. I got better, you know, as 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 we had the business longer and longer. But uh, it's always been a struggle for me. Always. I, I don't have a good answer for you. I just the answer I, I do have is do the best that you can at all walks of your life, and uh, I feel uh, over time you'll become better at all walks of your life. So, I think uh, thank you. An interesting follow-up to Jake's point was the idea of looking at the business of, you know, how, how in the weeds do you go versus how visionary yeah. do you want to be? Well, I'm an in, in the weeds kind of guy. <laughs> I, I'm a hands-on, I'm an operations driven kind of guy. And, um, yet I'm, I was also always a visionary as well. And I literally would think of things in the middle of the night and write them down and, and take them in. <laughs> and and some of my team members will tell you about some of the things that I dreamt up and they were what's abso- like the, what's like the absolute wild? failures. <laughs> what was one of those? Oh, one of them was, because uh, I'm a foodie too, and uh, <laughs> one of them was this chocolate bar. So a custard chocolate bar. Sounds pretty good, right? It sounds I, outstanding. It got cho- or vanilla custard on a stick, and then you dip it in the this chocolate and, and it hardens. Kind of like the Dilly Bar sure. at, at Dairy Queen, what they had. And, and uh, it absolutely flopped. Uh, <laughs> you know, there's too many things that uh, I say enough bad things about myself, so <laughs> I'm not going to say more. But yeah. Well, so what do you like? What's your process for that? Do you just try out the idea and, and yeah. give yourself kind of a little runway to, yeah, to that's, give it a shot? Yeah, and that's my mindset. We'll try it out. And if it flops, it flops. No big deal. Um, and, you know, our, our team today, it's, it's a little different. They're a little different than me, and especially in things like that. Uh, today's world, we analyze it. Yeah, of course. We analyze yeah. it and analyze it and analyze it. Get it out there. Just put it in the stores. Let's try it, you know. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, so... You know, entrepreneurs are risk takers, and and I'm certainly one of the, one of those calculated risks. But I flop once in a while. Do you think Many that when, when the company starts growing and you get kind of more of the corporate minded folks in your organization that you that you scares miss some me? Of that? Yeah. that scares me. <laughs> it does, and uh, I don't even like the word corporation. Yeah, I don't. Uh, <laughs> and I like to think of ourselves and as the little guy that does whatever it takes. Yeah. you know, never stops. It's uh, if you played basketball or football and you played across the line from somebody like that, uh, that never, that son of a gun, would you just stop? You know, <laughs> somebody you want to just plop on and just don't let them up. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's being competitive, I believe. And I love, I love that. Yeah. What other uh, questions we got? Um, Mr. Belter, I saw your hand go up in the back. Would you like to? Pass the microphone on back, Reed. To, oh, did you have one? Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead. First. Sure. We'll get thank you. Tom afterwards. First of all, thank you for being here. It's very much appreciated. Um, as somebody that's been in business for most of my career and struggling to finally, you know, get over the hump, and we're, at, we're fortunate to be at a spot where we're getting over the hump and finding some solid foundation, how did you know when you felt, did you get to a point where you just felt like solid and strength? Uh, in your business where you felt secure? And what were some of the signs that made you feel that way? Great question. I, I You know, I, I'm secure today. I'm, financially, I'm secure. But I don't ever feel that you're over the hump. I, 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 I don't. Uh, I, I mentioned a little earlier, you can go the other direction in a hurry if you allow it. So you've got to stay engaged, and you've got to stay competitive all the time. It never stops. It just never stops. Until the day that you sell out completely, that's the day I think you can sit back and relax and say, okay, we did pretty good. We did pretty good. But you ever see yourself doing that? Selling out? Oh, I've had bad days before. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, we sold 30% of the company, uh, what, four years ago, five years ago, to a private equity company. And... Uh, and and I'll, I'll, I'll say it. Uh, it was an opportunity for us to take some money, the family to take some money off the table. 
but we own 70% of the business. So, I mean, we are fully in charge. And for a private equity company to do that, to a minority share like that is very unusual. And that just, I guess that just shows how much they thought of us. So I'm sure in, in the back of their mind, they're thinking someday we'll, we'll get it a majority share or we'll get it all or something like that. Uh, but do I want to sell? No. No, I don't. Mm. It's, you know, it was a... I, I put our name there. I shouldn't have ever put our name up there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Craig, good seeing you again. Yeah, good uh, seeing you. I won't ask you to talk about bankers again. <laughs> <laughs> or or <laughs> but, uh, and Or about Bear Well, I used to go to the Ritz and the Farm Kitchen, and we were disappointed when it went from an A&W to whatever that next name was. So uh, it's good kind of growing up with you. But my real question is on the restaurant industry now and the labor-induced impact of all these restaurants closing down their their stores and just going drive up like a lot of mcdonald's won't even open an inside anymore what are you going to let culver's close down their insides and just be a drive up no absolutely not uh those those people that have done that they're losing market share we have gained market share because we've kept uh well there was a time we couldn't open the dining rooms right and then and, and some of our restaurants you know they've struggled with having enough people to open the dining room. So they have gone uh, drive through only just for a short period of time. But uh, no, I, if you want to lose market share, go ahead and do that. Uh, I want to gain market share. Oh, yeah, that's what I was talking about. Looking somebody in, not that you can't do that at drive through. Uh, you can still have plenty of hospitality at the drive through, but it's a little more difficult. Uh, but, uh, you know, the dining room is where we really, uh, really can shine. So, Mr. Culver, I'm Robbie Cordo. I'm a transplant from the Twin Cities to Oshkosh about six Golden six Valley. months ago. Golden Valley. And um, I uh, went to Ripon College, which is why I came back here. I love this area. Um, my question for you is, as a... By all, by most measures, probably a very successful business person, a successful operation. Congratulations. But what keeps you up at night? Kidney stone. <laughs> <laughs> what keeps me up at night? I, I sleep pretty good. I do. And, you know, every once in a while there's a something that goes on, you know, in work or something that, You'll think about it at four o'clock in the morning, uh, but generally, no. I sleep. I sleep pretty good. I do, and I think we're in good hands at at Culver's, and uh, we're going to stay that way. But yeah, business business can create some some sleepless nights sometimes. Do you think there's any any emerging threats or anything in the restaurant business that the Culver's needs to keep their eye on, or? No, the people thing is the labor shortage is it's it's the monster. Mm -hmm. It's the elephant. And we you know, people retention is so crucial. Um that you if you're gonna be successful in, in business you gotta you gotta keep the right people and you gotta be properly staffed. When you're not properly staffed, that's when you lose people as well because you stress people out. The next day they come to you or don't show up the next day. Uh, you know, if it's too stressful for them, so you got to be properly staffed, and you got to uh, you got to uh, training never stops either, and you got to be very professional about it as well. Uh, you don't throw somebody into the fire and hope they survive. No, they got to go through a proper training program, and you know when you do those things, you'll retain your people, and and you have to reward your people as well. Um, and sometimes that's not always money. Sometimes just a pat on the back or saying, you know, gosh, you did a good job today. You know, uh, it doesn't have to be, you know, a thousand dollar bill or something like that. But got letting people know, genuinely know that you care about them. 
That means a lot. Mm -hmm. That means a lot. So you had a question back there. So thank you again um, for being here. Um, my question to you is, real quick, how old were you when you started? Uh, well, Culver's, I was 34. 34? Yeah. Okay. Can you talk about some of the sacrifices that you had to make, maybe for some young entrepreneurs that they might have to make or that you had to make when building a business? Yeah. Like relative well, to your peers, probably. I, I was just sharing those, uh, balance of life. Yeah. You know, I, like I said, I, I wasn't home always when I was supposed to be. I... I didn't make the soccer matches and the volleyball matches for my girls and things like that. Uh, those are real sacrifices. Or the family gatherings. Uh, you know, many times I, I didn't make those. Uh, it was years later, and I, I worked seven days a week. I did. And, uh, you know, eventually I, I stopped working on Sundays. And, heck, I didn't, there was a period there where I didn't go to church for a heck of a long time uh, because I was working. Sunday's a busy day, you know. And so those those are the sacrifices that I made. And, uh, but all in all, you know, I'm so fortunate to have three wonderful daughters. One of them, uh, Chelsea, the youngest, uh, she's uh, 30. And uh, she just went through franchise training at Culver's. She graduated. She graduates next Thursday, as a matter of fact. And my other two daughters are, uh, they all ser serve as associate board members as well. So they're all very in tune to Culver's and what's going on. And um, they, own a, they own a big, because of trust, they own a big piece of Culver's, a real big piece of Culver's. So. We got one back here, Reed. So it was interesting to hear that you say you're on the board at <clears throat> Quick Trip, and uh, the reason I say that is uh, when you look at chain type businesses that you go to, and, and I own a business myself, and I'm acutely aware of customer service and the traits of people behind counters and things like that. And years ago, I traveled probably 300 nights a week, and I always said these claims of we have the friendliest people at Holiday Inn or whatever. It's like that all depends on the franchise owner. And, That's right. And the reality is that they fall short often. But <clears throat> uh, Quick Trip exceeds expectations regularly, no matter where you go, and other big places. And not to pick on Casey's, but in town as a, as a uh, difference. The quality of the service and the attitude and the friendliness is is there's no there's no comparison, right? And the same thing is true, I think, in a Culver's versus walking into a McDonald's or, or Burger King. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I'm kind of curious, did you pass that culture to the Zitlos or did they pass that to you? <laughs> <clears throat> I've been on the board for about 12 years, I guess. And uh, uh, I've noticed the similarities in our two companies. Uh, um, I'm honored to be on their board. Mm. Uh, they have taught me a lot. Uh, they are truly in the people business as well. Oh, yeah. Um, they, uh, well, Don, uh, if if you met Don, you'd know why. Mm -hmm. He is just uh, smart as can be, but a peach of a guy as yeah. well. And, um, and that's why I, I, I say I worry a little bit when Don says no more. Yeah. Uh, so if I'm not mistaken, he's comes from a farming family as well. Is that right? Uh, Don, uh, Don worked in the grocery store business oh, okay. uh, for many years and, uh, and he worked with Reinhardt, uh, oh. and, uh, and John Hansen. Now John Hansen is a dairy farmer or was a dairy farmer. The three of them started quick trip. Okay. And then, uh, Reinhardt died, and they bought his shares out. And then in the year 2000, I believe, uh, Hansen and Zitlow said, you buy me or I, I'll buy oh. you. 
and Zitlow's ended up buying them out. Okay. W one last thing. So we, we subscribe to a third-party survey to make sure we're serving our customers as we intend. <clears throat> and, w and our business is built on the notion that, you know, the difference between good care and great care is, is a great caregiver. And, and so we only hire about one in 25 applicants. We go through a real thorough process to make sure we're only getting the best of the best. And um, I would imagine your franchises are, are going through a similar thing like that. But no, we'll hire all 25. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, so anyway, one of the th when we get these surveys, uh, one of the things they ask caregivers is um, how, how well do you think you're appreciated or how is appreciation shown? And I got the opportunity to meet you one before, once before, and I don't know if you remember, but we give away quick trip cards when we want to incentivize people to mm -hmm. do something, pick up an extra shift or whatever. But when we want to show appreciation, we give Culver cards. Oh, and they're, thank you. <clears throat> and <clears throat> excuse me, they're only we give out a five dollar gift card, and um, and in those surveys, there's probably in the neighborhood of six or seven caregivers surveyed every month, and I would guess that four of them mentioned the Culver's card that they got. They, wow. they make all the difference. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that very much. We got any last questions? Because uh, we're we're knocking down time. Soon we got Katie with the Northwestern over here. So don't say anything dumb now. <laughs> <laughs> I've I've said it all. <laughs> no, I'm I'm just curious. Like, I mean, I I told you I started at Culver's when I was 14 years old. It was technically my second job, but my first real job. Um, and I know it like very personally. I'm just curious, like how you look at the whole industry now, like it's become this big thing. I'm just curious if it's still very personal to you. And secondly, if you had known it had, it was going to get this big, would you have done anything differently when you mm. start? When you say the industry, you mean Culver's or you mean yeah, just the whole Culver. I'm just curious how you see Culver's now because I still picture the Culver's that I worked at, but obviously it's much bigger. It's 800. Well, I take stores. it very personally. <laughs> I do. Uh, I mean, it's very close to my heart. Uh, um, but uh, the second part of the question was what? If you would have known how, it, how big it was going to get, would you have done anything differently when you started? No, I, I would have told you that we would never get this size. I, I can't believe it yet today. I mean, um, I mean, going from one to two restaurants, guess what? You're doubling in size when you do that. And, uh, um, and that was not an easy thing uh, for us to do. And then we did the third, and I never, you know, people ask me, did you have a grand plan? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't think many entrepreneurs have a, a grand plan. The, uh, there's a lot of luck involved, but there's a lot of passion involved as well. And um, It's never been that important to me to see how fast we can grow. It isn't. Uh, as my dad said, you got to take care of what you got. And what you have is what will also help you grow into the future if you're doing it the right way. And that's why we don't market franchises for sale or we don't do that. Like I said, they come, we, they come to us. And I believe every restaurant that we open is a, is a marketing opportunity to grow our business, but also to take care of more guests, take care of more, more customers. So, and to develop more people with opportunities. You see, we, uh, we have a lot of people like yourself that started with us when they were 14, 15, 16 years old. I'll bet we've got 100 of those people that are now owners of Culver franchises. Uh, it's, it's called a mentoring program that we do. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you what, that's something that really warms your heart. Uh, and they take our culture along with us when they open their restaurant. Florida, for example, We've got 80-some restaurants in Florida right now, and I'll bet at least half of those came from Wisconsin. I'll <laughs> bet that, yeah, and it started with us in you know, a Wisconsin restaurant when they were 15 or 16, and now they're owners of their, their own restaurants. Snowbirds. Arizona's the same way, yeah. 
Yeah. My brother lives in New York City, and he wants to open <coughs> Culver's there. So that's his end game. You think New York City will ever get a Culver's? <laughs> <laughs> He's going to bring it there. <laughs> My last question is, what's your favorite flavor of the day? Uh, what, what, what was favorite it? flavor of the day? Yeah. Vanilla, of course. <laughs> <laughs> got a gallon of it sitting over here if you guys want to test it out. No, uh, talking about New York, uh, will we get there someday? I'm sure we will, but there's no rush. There's no rush. Uh, we're not a publicly traded company where, you know, the shareholders are screaming at us, you got to grow, grow, grow. No, we'll grow at our own pace. And as far as going to the Northeast, um, as far as we are in that direction right now is the state of Ohio. Uh, we're not in Pennsylvania, but... That's how we grow. We go grow like like this versus all over the place. The southeast, we're in the Carolinas and Georgia and and Florida and, and uh, Alabama. Um, we've got so many places to go. And people also ask me about going, you know, uh, um, to other countries. We're not ready to do that. We don't have to. We... We'll grow right here in the good old USA. Um, we got a long ways to go right here. All right, we got one one last question from Ben here. And, yeah. uh, I'm just curious what your Culver's order is. Are you like a four piece guy or? My do you like the butter burger deluxe? <laughs> <laughs> I do. I like the single yeah. deluxe. Yeah. So like, what's what's your order though? Like when you drive through a Culver's? Well, I've tried to. Right now, I'm not eating fries. No. I'm not eating anything <laughs> fried. <laughs> Just just because I'm trying to uh, lose a couple yeah, pounds. Yeah. But today I had a double butter burger. And here, here's something for you. When people ask me, they've never had a, 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 a butter burger. I mm -hmm. say, go in one of our restaurants, order a double butter burger, no cheese, no ketchup, nothing on it. Just Fold. just the meat. And uh, to get the true taste of what we serve at Culver's. And that's what I had today. Uh, just checking on the beef and... <laughs> I mean, it was so good. Just the purest, the yeah. purest Culver's That's right. right there. Yeah. Yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks you're for the, welcome. Thanks for the time. Thanks for the questions. We do have a, a special gift for you here. I don't know if you're a, a bourbon guy or not, but um, Wyatt's got got a special bourbon here as a token of our appreciation for your time today. So, uh, Pappy. <laughs> Pappy. <laughs> hey, thank, thank you, you again. Appreciate much. your time. You know, we're building a new house on Green Lake. Uh, we're going to sell our... Our house on the south side. We're moving to the north side of the lake, and uh, and uh, we're putting a bourbon room. Good on the second <laughs> floor. So this will this will be perfect for that. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, Thank one, you. One round of applause here for Craig. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. All right. Well, Thank, Thank you, you again, Aaron. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you.